The Open University's Contemporary Cultures of Writing Research Group is absolutely delighted to be partnering with MK LitFest on this series, the long and short of it, from flash fiction to the doorstop novel. Each of our online events is being chaired by a PhD student at the OU or a recent graduate and film clips will be included in a new version of our undergraduate advanced creative writing course. You can find out more about our creative writing provision on the Open University's creative writing and English web pages. Please do post questions in the chat as soon as they come to you. Don't wait until the end, because then there'll be a, a mad rush to try and get the questions to our guest tonight, Emily Bullock. Um, I'll be collating them and I'll put them to Emily when we turn to questions from the floor. If the chat function isn't accessible to you, then when we get to questions from the floor, please use the raise your hand function and I'll endeavor to get to as many of you as possible. Uh, captions can be enabled if that is helpful to you too. So tonight's session will focus on the novella. What exactly is the novella, we might ask? An exploded short story, a compacted novel, or something else entirely? And on that intriguing note, <laughs> I'm going to hand over to Sarah, who will introduce you to tonight's guest. Thank you, Emma, and welcome everybody to um, this event with Emily Bullock. Um, I'm Sarah Bauer. I'm an associate lecturer and a PhD candidate in creative and critical writing at the Open University. And I'm delighted to welcome Emily um, to talk about her new novella, For Always Only, which is due out later this year. Emily is the author of two novels and a collection of short stories, Human Terrain, which was long listed for the Edge Hill Prize in 2022. Her story, My Girl, won the Bristol Short Story Award and was broadcast on Radio 4. Emily worked in film before turning to writing full time and is now Senior Lecturer in Creative Writing at the OU. Warm welcome to Emily. Emily, I am tempted to call this session only what fits in the box. It seems to me like a good place to start with a slender form like the novella, and this particular slender novella, which is um, it uses an enormously long novel, Finnegan's Wake, as a sort of organising principle. Um, I wondered um, if you think that the novella form requires some kind of thematic organisation. Um, I think uh, my novella definitely did, just purely help me get a grip with <laughs> Finnegan's Wake, which I'm not entirely sure I ever did. Uh, but yes, it helps, I think, to really sort of hone down your ideas so that you have something else to sort of hang your story on hooks, if you like. Um, so I don't think it's essential, but I think it can be a really good way to get information to the reader and to be able to focus it yourself when you're writing so that it doesn't end up, you're writing a novel and then you just trim it down <laughs> to novella length. Um, I think also particularly novellas in flash, uh, most of the ones I've enjoyed, they really need something to hold them together. Um, I was thinking about like Death by Anna Croissant Rust. She uses death as that thematic idea to link every single story together and they're all completely different stories. But I think you need that kind of focus. Um, and for me, I suppose it was the humour of taking a huge novel, <laughs> huge impenetrable novel, and trying to make something that for me was short, contained and to the point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you achieved that extremely well and, and, and hats off to you. <laughs> um, to reduce down further, the, the novel takes place in, in, in quite a hermetic world. It's got a small number of locations which are explored in um, particular detail, but especially Bloomsbury, I would say. Um, to what extent do you think the novella is suited to closed worlds? I think it's a really useful device because by having those, you know, less locations, you can really bring them alive for the reader. It allows you a lot more um, ways to show in detail a particular place and then to be able to sort of refer to it in shorthand and your the reader should know exactly where they are what things look like um, and if you were to expand that I think to 
a huge canvas of places or countries, it would make the novella's task really hard. Um, and I think maybe that's something novellas in Flash can do, but not a traditional novella. Um, I was thinking of some of my favourite other novellas, like A House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros and um, The Old Man in the Sea, Hemingway. They're all really particular and specific locations. Um, but I think from that base, it allows you then to go out and explore bigger things, bigger ideas, but to have that grounding for the reader. Mm -hmm. And I think I, for me, I chose Bloomsbury because I wanted a, a kind of contained world like Joyce's Dublin. Um, but I, I suppose I was also playing with that idea of like Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own and, you know, how lovely that is, but only if you had a lovely room <laughs> on Bloomsbury <laughs> Square and not if you ended up in like a bedsit with no money like uh, the character in my novella. So I was trying to tie it into those other literary traditions, but not taking them too seriously. Yeah, so not not quite the kind of room that Mrs Wolfe would have had in mind, I suspect. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, having talked about the, the physical containment of, of, of the book, not just in the places, but as you point out, it, a lot of it takes place in this very small bedsit, um, which you define early on in terms of sort of steps across the room and that kind of thing. Um, by contrast to that, I managed to count five different plot lines in this story. Um, and I'd love to hear you talk a bit more about how you managed to weave all that into such a, 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 a slender and beautifully formed book. Yeah, I, well, I'm curious. I wonder if we even have the same five storylines. Oh, well, we can always, I we can doubt, always Yeah, I started <laughs> to count them and I'm like, yeah, no, there are. But I think because in part it's that idea of having the thematic link of Finnegan's Wake. Um, and a lot of the story is about how the character ends up in that room on, in Bloomsbury. Um and the absence of her mother. And I, so I think a lot of the storylines for me, they sort of overlapped and connected. So it wasn't that I think there's a lot of plot in the novella, which it probably couldn't handle too much of given the limited word count, but they should be sort of interconnected storylines and they have a, a sort of a, an accumulative effect I was hoping for, but um, because they're connected that that should allow the reader to sort of move between those storylines without feeling too lost hopefully and because also it's um the first person narrator is see the character I think it's all experienced through her that it does allow me to explore those different storylines of her own life as we all do as people we have different storylines um, there is um, there's a line on, I think, page 23 of the book in which you say books can be like that. They can flick you back to the past or dash you forward to the future. Um, and it's a bit of a related question, really, um, uh, which I think you've begun to talk about. Um, if we could talk a little bit more about the way in which you use chronology and flashbacks. Um, yes, I was trying to in the novella represent that experience of reading, um, but how easy it is to fall out of whatever you're reading into your own thoughts. So it's it's like it can act for a trigger for memories or experiences. And I know myself when I'm reading, can, I can often just find I've wandered off <laughs> into another <laughs> thought and have to bring myself back. But I, I think that is the power of books, isn't it? That you can not only read, but you can, read bits of your own life in between the lines and we never we never read the same text so I was trying to sort of emulate that but so show, showing how this impenetrable book when it's something is even more difficult to understand that's often when we our minds wander so I wanted to sort of weave in and out of the past so that it's always there and I suppose because the mother's an absence in Issy's life. I tried not to be afraid of making her an absence in the story. So I actually found I did end up cutting out a lot of the backstory. That's interesting, yeah. Because I kind of felt that it needed about to be about here and now. And that actually I could 
hopefully provide also for the reader a sense of this missing mother in the storyline. Yeah, but it's very interesting that that, that that you sort of wrote a lot and cut it out because I think that's probably a process that other writers in the room will um, recognise and sympathise with. Um, can I ask you specifically here about a very, very powerful visual image that comes near the, the, the beginning of the book, which is the man falling from the ladder. Um, he, he does return later, but I'll gloss over how because I don't want to give things away. But um, I, it, it is in some ways quite isolated and I wonder what you wanted it to signify. I wanted it to be short and shocking like you say and it does <clears throat> sort of come back later with echoes in the story so it's also functioning as a sort of foreboding of other deaths that will might or might not <laughs> occur <laughs> in, in the novel um, but I also wanted her response to it to be the important thing mm. so that it, there is a sort of numbness to her so she puts the experience on to someone else who's also at the scene and sort of imagines their response um, and I suppose it for me it kind of brought together the some of the storylines this idea that you know we're not always the hero in our own story and sometimes things crash into our life like Covid does later in the story and it's about how that affects us, particularly when it's things we haven't experienced, perhaps, but we're witness to. Mm. And I think it, for me, it sort of became a symbol of her mother and her mother leaving her and how, as a child, if a parent leaves in that way, you can find yourself in the middle of someone else's story. And it's not necessarily a story you'll ever understand, like she'll never know why the man fell from the ladder or who he was um and it isn't um a sort of an episode in Finnegan's Wake as well but that that isn't something the reader needs to know that's just part of her experience of reading it and those events that happened to her it, it, it is a it is a very effective motif and I would say probably all the more so for in some ways being left hanging for the reader to puzzle over <laughs> um it, 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 it's very good um now you, you're a writer of novels and short stories as, as well as the novella emily um and i wonder how do you go about working out which form might best serve the story that you want to tell <clears throat> um i think i always know to start with what a short story or when it's going to be a short story um but then I usually find I haven't actually got enough story. So I have to sit and wait <laughs> for another idea. And those then those two ideas become a short story. Um, novels, I found you just knew they had to be long, <laughs> if that makes it. You knew there was so many people, um, so many places, such a large amount of time frame that I couldn't contain it in anything else um but the novella was it was a slightly different approach I think I'd been working my way up to it because obviously as I'm sure we'll talk about later we're aware they're not very commercially viable <laughs> <laughs> yeah. if at yeah. all so I had written the novel before Inside the Beautiful Inside it was a very short novel at 54,000 words mm. and I just started to find myself more attracted to writing experimental sort of narratives and I wouldn't expect a reader to stay with me for 70 90,000 words but a novella just gave me room to play I think mm. and experiment and not feel that I was asking too much of the reader to go on that journey with me mm. hopefully yeah, I think that's a really interesting point that it's it, it, it is quite a playful form I think um when, when, and we, we we will perhaps come on to um talk about that and and experimental experiment in the novella a bit later um do you have a, a different process when deciding what to include in a novella as opposed to in a novel or a short story i think so i, th I think it's part of what you touched on earlier it's having that thematic link that i could connect a story to that almost sort of functions as a shorthand if you like, mm -hmm. um, that I can pin a story to certain events 
and people, but not have to write the whole narrative of that story. So I still did, I think I overwrote and I cut some out, but not, you know, I never wanted it to be a novel. I think I started to fool myself to begin with saying it would just be a short novel. <laughs> but then when it started edging towards that, it, the idea and the story and the characters, they wouldn't stretch to that. So I found I cut bits out, but then as soon as you cut something else out, I had to write something else and put that back in. So it became a real balancing act. I think the most it ever got to was about 45,000 words. Mm -hmm. So that's not too bad, but that wouldn't stand as a novel in the current sort of publishing marketplace. Sort of a no man's land, that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's novels are like short stories mm -hmm. in that I think it is also about what you haven't written and those spaces and gaps. And in some ways it asks more of the reader to be involved than a novel where I might, you know, paint every picture for them and lead a reader through this world by the hand. In a novella and a short story, I'm I'm asking them to be active in that process and to fill in the gaps themselves, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, and, and you do that very well. And I think one example of, of how you um, ask us to fill in the gaps is the way in which you use lists, particularly Issy's shopping lists and the things which recur on her shopping list, the flapjacks, the paracetamol, et cetera. Um, I wonder how, how the decision to use lists as a literary device might relate to your decision to make this story a novella. <clears throat> yes, it's not a device I'd ever used before. And I think when I first, um, it first occurred in my first draft, I think that's the point which I realized, oh, this is <laughs> this could really work as in it again, it's a shorthand for the reader, and you can say a lot by that repetition, but with not having to use many words and not, trying not to draw attention to it, but just by the mere fact of it being repeated and in a list, it really should draw a reader's eye to what's happening. So I think I I sort of discovered how well it was working in this particular story and then really sort of went with it. And having it pointed out, I was sort of reading through and going, yes, it's in the narrative as well. It's not just those lists at the beginning of the chapters. And I think it's it's a way, isn't it, of stripping everything right back narrative-wise and leaving that space around it at, so I can draw readers' attention with a very limited word count. <laughs> yes, yes, it, it, and it also has a sort of lovely look on the page as well, I think. Um, and that leads me to um, my next question, which has to do with the novella and poetry, I guess. Um, you use quite a lot of short and imperfect and complete sentences here, which gives the book a poetic and quite mesmeric rhythm I think when you read it there are a lot of repeating rhythms going on there I wonder if the novella might be intrinsically a more poetic form than the full-length novel I think you're right because I mean poetry is the ultimate kind of you know brevity and concision and every single thing every full stop counts and the more I started to write the novella I'm more I sort of was aware you can't not pay attention to every sentence and every sort of comma and full stop where I think sometimes when I was writing a novel you are aware of those things and you're editing and reading but because there's so much you couldn't possibly expect a reader to cope with that level of poetry <laughs> over such a lengthy thing and I don't think I could sustain it um, but it really helps to build rhythms, build patterns, build connections. And so in that way, the novella does function like poetry, I, I suppose. Or I was thinking about the, you know, the novel, uh, the novellas I've enjoyed and um, having written that one, that's the way it came out. And I also think because it's in the first person, 
it's a good way to represent internal thoughts. You know, we don't necessarily think in full sentences and they don't always connect. We jump around. And so it allowed me to experiment and play again, I suppose, with yeah. the forms. Like supplementary here, did you kind of intuitively start to write like that? Or were you very conscious that, that this was the style you were going to employ for this particular book? I'd love to say that I knew what, exactly what I was doing when I was starting, but I don't think I did. Please I think, don't, I'll feel it, yeah, yeah, no, it was um, intuitive that I think the outline of it was there. And then when you go back and you read, and I often find that I have to, I have to have done a full draft by before I actually know what I thought I was writing and what I thought I was writing is usually not what I've written and I have to restart and redo it again and so I would say for me most of that is in the editing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I have to have had something there to discover if that makes sense yes I, I, a lot is in the editing isn't it I, I, I think um ha having talked about style now might be a good opportunity Emily if you're willing to um give us a short reading please Yes, lovely. I thought I would just read the opening of the novella. Lovely. Thank and um, <clears throat> I think we might spot some lists in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, I used to tell people I met, the readers, you should try Finnegan's Wake. Not that I've ever, ever managed to finish it myself. Suppose I was hoping they might do what I hadn't and tell me all about it. But sometimes there is no easy way. Critic Oliver St. John Gogarty declared it one of the biggest piss takes in literature. He used to be Joyce's friend, probably until he went round saying things like that. To be honest, I could do with a laugh. I put my bag down by the narrow bed. It sags with the weight of other people's dreams, but at least the duvet doesn't look stained. All I brought with me was a pillow and a sheet. I won't be here long. The whole place could be crossed in a few steps. Kitchen, bed, table, chair, shelves, window, bathroom behind a door. I reach across the room, place Finnegan's wake on the empty bookshelf, drop my keys on top. Over the years, there have been many full starts. I'd only ever get a few chapters in, reaching the midpoint once, but now I'm finally going to finish it. No TV, no radio, no other books, magazines, cereal, packets, pizza flyers, all distractions left behind. Everything I own is in the access storage at Bell Green. All there is is this flat, this weekend bag of hooded top, T-shirt, jogging bottoms, sports bra, belly warmer pants, packet of ramen noodles, strip of paracetamol, a flapjack and Finnegan's Wake. But I've already counted all that I have and still haven't started this book. There's not much point making myself at home. The keys, I pick them up off the book, slip them into my pocket. Still 55 minutes to go. Might as well get started. The chair's faded red brocade is worn through in small patches. Feels like chicken bones poking into me as I settle down. I open the book. It's heavier than it should be but it has collected some weight over the years. The spine is creased like the lines about my eyes and mouth. There's a joke there about collecting, my, collecting weight myself, but I'm too tired to make it. I balance myself with feet up on the windowsill. Flicking through, I find postcards, receipts, notes, leaves tucked between the pages. It would be best to dump all these bits and pieces into a bin. Silver specks of glitter settle on my fingertips and lap. For my last birthday, Alan bought me Richard Ellman's biography of James Joyce. The book was nestled in a cardboard box embossed with butterflies and glitter, cosseted beneath three layers of golden tissue paper. He smiled when he said, now you can sound convincing when you pretend to have read Finnegan's Wake. I might have taken it as only a gift if it hadn't been so beautifully, so carefully concealed. I never saw it coming, but then I never do. I'll leave the other specks of history untouched or I'll never get started. I lie on the bed, put my feet back on the peeling windowsill. When a land begs me to be forgiven, begs me to return, I plan on telling him about my project to finally finish this book. I'll probably say, 
I might come back when I'm done reading. Let's see where it takes me. It will prove something to him, although I'm not sure what. Lovely. Thank you very much, Emily. That was really, really um, enjoyable and, uh, and and gave a, a great impression of the, the lyricism of the book and its sort of wistfulness, I guess. Um, most of the novella is narrated in the present tense. And although this is more commonly used in narrative writing than it used to be, it remains controversial with some readers, I know. Can we talk a bit about why you chose to use the present tense and whether there's anything particular to the novella that made you make that choice? Um, I, I chose it for its immediacy. Um, as you sort of mentioned later, there's some flashbacks and um, some memories, backstory that occurs in the piece. So I wanted that distinction between where the character is now and how she feels her past has sort of weighed her down, if you like. Um, but I also wanted to represent that idea of reading, you know, to be in the moment and for something to be happening and not a completed action. So I, I, for me, it, I felt that for this particular story, it, it lent a certain amount of tension as to, will she ever finish the book? <laughs> will she get to the end? <laughs> we never quite know because we're, we're stuck there in the present with her. And I also think sometimes, you know, sort of those ideas or those things of isolation and um, hopelessness that she's experiencing, they can feel like a continual present. So for me, it, it fitted the story that she feels she's trapped in a present that mm. just goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm which actually is is probably something that a lot of people experienced during COVID, which features mm. heavily in the book. And of course, we didn't know <laughs> where we were going with that anyway, did we? So there is that, yeah, that sense of the continuous present is is, is very powerful. Thank you. Um, also, as um, we have already mentioned, um, the book's narrated in the first person, and that helps to create kind of quick level of intimacy between reader and, and, and character. Do you think the novella invites a first person narrative? Um, uh, perhaps because of that business of creating a relationship between character and reader mm. sort of quickly and economically? Yes, I think it does help lend a real focus to a story. And it, it gives you, doesn't it, that, that sort of the character, the first person becomes your anchor point so no matter where you might go it's all filtered through one person mm. and if you can get to know them you don't necessarily need to know all of the story you can start to piece things together or have an understanding of how they might react to things um, so I think it lends itself well but I was resistant when I started <laughs> I started in the focus third um, but struggled to really find who she was, what the character and what was happening. Um, and you say, as you mentioned about COVID and lockdown, and I started to think, actually, if I'm going to put the character through these things, then I have to let her speak for herself. <laughs> it has to be her thoughts and her experience. Um, and perhaps because in some ways, you know, it, it isn't me, but it was my first longer length of writing a female narrator of a similar age and similar background. So I resisted first person because I didn't want to mingle it with myself. Um, but in the end, she fought back and it had to had to go to the first. <laughs> I was going to ask you, actually, um, it, did anybody else compete to become the narrating character or was it always Izzy? I think there's a certain argument that Sunshine, her mother, would like her own story. <laughs> and I, I really resisted having anything from her point of view. She occurs in flashbacks and she's a her absence is a constant presence in the story. Mm. So I do feel she might have some short stories of her own that she wants to tell. But I, I yeah, I, 
I had to bar her from <laughs> taking part in this narrative. She can get to tell her story another time. <laughs> yes, excellent. Thank you. Um, we mentioned briefly earlier, but let's come back to that now, that the novella um, is seen by the commercial publishing industry to some extent as neither fish nor fowl. Um, and uh, I think we noticed that when a high profile author like Ian McEwan writes a novella such as On Chesil Beach, or indeed um, more recently, Samantha Harvey's Orbital, um, they're sold as novels, not novellas. Mm -hmm. And yet they're both slender books of about 130 pages. Um, I would say that they were clearly novellas. Um, why do you think the form has such an uneasy relationship with mainstream publishing? I, it's really, I find it quite sad and disappointing. Um, but you're right, it, it's as if writers get paid per word. And if you don't supply enough words, you don't mm. deserve <laughs> to be a nice hardback or softback on the bookshelf. Um, but you're right, they then do just tend to pad the, you know, the novella, they they make it a larger print or they put more pages in. And I think it, it kind of misses the whole point of a novella. And it's almost that the novella is so, um, or, you know, like the classics are so successful at what they do. It, it is that sleight of hand trick. It should feel like a novel. It should feel, although it's, you know, it has brevity, that it has depth and scope beyond the word count and by not sort of allowing it that form and that genre we're just calling it something in, that it's not it's almost as if when they're so successful like the great Gatsby or you know Giovanni's room or prime of misty Brody or whatever you know that we can't allow it its own space it has to conform to mm. the novel but it's it isn't that they're, they're just different and it's as much about the weight of what isn't written should be as powerful as what is on the page mm -hmm. and no one thinks a great novella should be longer like it <laughs> and how many novels have I read and just thought that like Finnegan's Wake if only this was shorter <laughs> yeah. done that in half the pages yes <laughs> yeah and it does it, like Orbital like you say it yeah. encompasses so many different sort of characters and places and mm -hmm. experiences but it wouldn't be the same if it had a 70,000 plus word count. And it it's almost that the ones that get through are so good at what they do. It's like people don't realise the magic trick that's mm. just happened. They think it must be something else. And to, I suppose in some ways disrespect that a reader isn't willing to invest time in a shorter piece, a shorter novella and, you know, just make them cheaper then <laughs> to print less pages <laughs> oh, don't make on. them so massive <laughs> yeah because nobody gets paid per word <laughs> no it, it it is i i do just wonder though whether um with the cost of actually printing books having gone up so much whether the novella might find a moment with those who are more interested in money than than yeah you'd like to think so or different the artistic side yeah different authors in a collection you know instead of short stories have two or three novellas and I yeah. as a reader I would find that really exciting yeah yeah and they're, they're just I like the nice objects you know mm. um we've mentioned Samantha Harvey and um I think it's notable that a number of our contemporary um outstanding contemporary novella writers are women I'm thinking of Fleur Yegi um, Samantha Schwebling, Mina Kandasamy, Maria Gainza, um, Samantha Harvey, we've mentioned. I wonder, is that a conversation to be had about gender and the novella? You yeah, put, I guess. Put the old man and the sea to one side for yes. now. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I think it is one conversation of many, and that's what's so powerful about the novella. There's so much to say and so many things to investigate for something that is such a short form. Um, I think it's probably that idea again of, um, I mean, Mina Kandasamy says it herself, doesn't she, that writing in the margins. Yeah. It, it's an idea, it's a way to explore ideas and to write about things without having to say them explicitly. So that idea you can be saying one thing 
and meaning another. And I suppose traditionally there's been that idea that um, women, that's what women had to do to communicate is to not necessarily say what you mean, but to be able to leave things hanging and to have gaps and for a lot to be said in those sort of um, omissions. Um, but also I think it's a way to correct those ideas that novella is an inconsequential thing or it's a you know it's less worthy than a novel you can take it and do something different with it if you like it it's almost like you can be in the margins yourself you can experiment and play and not necessarily be judged or discovered <laughs> if you like but it, it's quiet stories can work really well um and things that aren't being said. Um, but to use Hemingway as an example, I mean, his novellas are muscular, energetic, sinewy. Yes, and yeah. yet if, you know, Samantha Schriebling's Fever Dream, you know, some people criticised it for being too suffocating or dread or claustrophobia. And you're like, that's what they were trying to create. <laughs> that's not what she was up to. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so brevity doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing um so I, I think it's one of many conversations but it is interesting that it, there are a lot more women and experimental female writers using the form I think so it'll be interesting to see where it goes yeah, it's also, um, we, we, we must go to, there's lots and lots of lovely questions um, appearing, so we must go to that shortly. Um, but just another thing which crossed my mind while I was listing those is that quite a lot of those are not writing in English and are coming to us in mm. translation. And I wonder if um, there is a healthier novella climate in some other languages. Um, yeah, then... and I mean, it's we don't get a lot of translated novels necessarily in the UK or that are you know marketed and published as such so, so I bet yeah there is a lot happening that we're just not aware of and that's not making it through which is which is um a sad yeah. <laughs> a sad thought but yeah we have to hope that hope that that changes in future Emily, thank you very much. Thank you, um, Sarah. For sharing your thoughts with us um, and for talking about your novella, um, which um, is going to be out later this year and is a fabulous read. I'm thrilled to recommend it to everybody who's here. Um, so I think we're going to be moving on to the questions shortly. Okay. Um, and Emma is going to join us for that, I believe. Uh, hi, everyone. I think Dave's about to spotlight me. There we go. Um, thank you uh, for such a fascinating conversation. And thank you for everyone in the audience for um, putting such great questions into the chat. You're, you're really brilliant audience members. Um, I'm going to kick off with a question from Rebecca Latin Rawstrone, who is one of our creative writing PhD students. Um, and in fact, Rebecca will be chairing the um, event next week with Amit Chowdhury, who is a novelist who's also written novellas, uh, albeit often uh, marketed as novels. <laughs> um, but Rebecca has a question about um, technique. She says, Emily, that your novella is particularly good at exploring the potentially audible atmosphere of the unsaid in relationships. And she wonders if you think the shorter form is better suited to paired back detailed observations and if you notice your writing style shifting when you write in different forms. Uh, yes, to both. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, Rebecca's right. It, I, it almost like the more I, I had to write myself in to the novella, I think. But the more you start to write and the more you are aware of wanting to, to keep things short, you develop a sense of how far or rather how much you can not say, you know, what is, what's the bare minimum I can give here, but still evoke emotion or, you know, what it is, whatever it is you're trying to do in a particular scene. And sometimes I found that that was often about focusing on one particular thing. 
So with the dialogue, it was often about um, trying to convey that they might be talking to each other, but they're not communicating. And that's part of the problem. Um, and then for other scenes, it might have been, you know, putting all the focus on one particular thing and ignoring this other huge thing that's happening, like the man falling from the ladder, you know, she puts it on to another person who's at the scene and thinks about what they might be feeling or how the man, you know, I hope the man got up that morning, I think she says, and I hope he had a good breakfast and someone smiled at him on the tube and, and none of it's about what she's feeling or processing. And, um, and I think the novella form really does allow you to do that or rather hones your focus, I suppose, you know, what is it in this scene that I need to convey and what can I leave out and let the reader bring themselves or draw attention to because I'm not mentioning it. Bronwyn Griff asks whether you always set out to write a novella in this case and what you see as the main challenges to writing a successful novella. Um, I, th I think I told myself it was a short novel to begin with. So I always knew it would probably never make it past 50,000 words, but I thought I can still call it a novel perhaps. But the more I started to write, the more I realized it was a novella and that I would be able to put more sort of impact and uh, emotional resonance into it by saying less and cutting out a lot of um, some of the backstory and the flashbacks and leaving it unsaid like in their dialogue they don't say a lot to each other and it's um leaving those gaps in the relationship between the couple to sort of fester if you like and it, it ends up tainting the whole relationship and her life at that particular point i think that uh links quite nicely to a question we've had from phil olson um, he says that the commissioning editor at Salt Publishing uh, talks about having commissioned quite a few short novels. Uh, he's thinking of the likes of Alison Moore and Will Menmuir, um, two short novels that uh, were shortlisted for major prizes and, and won major prizes. Um, and what apparently the commissioning editor says is that there is a difference between the short novel and the novella and uh, Phil's hoping you might talk a little bit more about how you might differentiate between those two forms, even if they might be similar lengths. Yeah, yeah. I can see, yes, it, it's that idea, isn't it, that they're similar lengths, but they're attempting to do very different things. And I think the end result is very different as well. So a short novel might just be about a short incident or you know less story but a novella it can it can pack a lot in and be about a lot of different things um like orbital I suppose you know it encompasses the whole of humanity <laughs> at the end of it but it is not attempting to be an epic or a saga and so I think perhaps novellas uh, what was the way of putting it novellas might have huge ideas about showing you know how what humanity's like or what people are like but it wants to do it by leaving things out it doesn't want to just focus on one particular thing it wants to bring in lots of stuff but keep it short if uh, that's that's a hard thing to kind of distinguish but i i do really feel that they are attempting to do different things so they should feel, a short novel should feel different from a novella. I often think a novella is, I think I kind of said before, it should feel like a novel, but almost as if every other page is missing. It, it's making you fill in all those gaps. So like the book at, in the beginning of this, where she stuffed it with letters and leaves and things from the past, it, it should feel that weighty and heavy, but it's all air. <laughs> it's a it's a lightness to it, or a, the lack should be its strength. That's a great way of putting it. The lack should be its strength. We've got an interesting debate going on in the chat between um, 
one of our PhD students, Jupiter Jones, who is a novella writer herself, and um, another audience member, Cooper, about whether there's any sense of the novella being a, an apprentice form for the novel or vice versa. Okay, I found it harder to write than my novels, if that, so I don't think I, I could have attempted to write that without having written a novel or being a short story. I, I Yeah, I, I couldn't have gone to that form, first of all. I think you would make, you'd make mistakes or you'd just end up telling or not doing, you know, leaving out the wrong bits because you weren't aware of what you were doing. Or I wasn't, you know, I say we, I wasn't aware or in control enough. And the novel, novella all becomes about control and that really stripping back, you know, it's um, you want that balance of showing and telling, but you can't show that much. So it, it is a kind of sleight of hand trick. It's like, I will show you this, but I also want you to be aware of what I'm not showing you. <laughs> um, during our short story session last week, we were talking about the importance of effective telling and how that's often an aspect of the craft that's not sufficiently well taught. Mm. So it's interesting that you touch upon that again. Uh, we're getting um, a question in the chat from Julian Crooks, who's asking about beginnings and endings mm. and which might be the most important and or the most difficult uh, for the writer of the novella. Um, I suppose I can't speak speak for other writers in you know how they approached it um for me I had an idea of how it had to end and because it's Finnegan's Wake you know it had to link back it had to be that you know cyclical so it had to start again if you like so that there's a there's echoes of Finnegan's Wake there but when I write I always have an idea of where it's going I find starting points quite hard often and often I start too early and have to remove it and start at a later point. But because it was a novella and it was a, mainly about being in one room, I knew it had to start with her arrival in the room. I, I kind of got myself into a corner there and that was the only place I could begin. <laughs> it, that's quite advantageous I think. <laughs> um, Isolde Walker is asking about chapters, uh, mm. length and quantity and whether you feel that there's an ideal number of chapters or length of chapters in novellas. Um, I don't think so because again it's this idea isn't it that you because it's shorter you can experiment and play more so you could, I've read great novellas that are all one chapter and just, you know, speed through and others that use chapters to break up and disrupt meaning and the flow. Um, and so it becomes like film editing, you know, you cut from one thing to another. So I did find a lot of the chapters were shorter than I would have ever written in a, not in a novel. Um, but that was quite fun for me I think as a writer it's suddenly like okay actually I'm going to end this chapter <laughs> in two pages so I, I better get a shift on and <laughs> wrap up what I'm trying to say and what's going on I, I, you haven't got that length where you can be like oh, I could just do this novel chapter for another page and look at this sunset that's beautiful and I'll bring that in and so no it, it's um it, it allows you to experiment, I think, and push the reader a lot more than I would ever expect them to do for a novel length piece of work. Melissa Albon's writing a novella or a short novel herself, uh, and she's asking about word counts that tip the novella into mm. the short novel. And um, she is thinking that her work is going to come out about 60,000 words, and she's asking whether that falls between two stools. I would no, I would say 60 was acceptable for a novel. I, I think maybe you'd be thinking about that boundary if you were about 50,000. You might have to make 
that decision, you know, am I going to leave it as this or am I going to up it or am I really going to try and restructure it, reshape it as a novella? Um, so I think officially novellas are normally about 40,000 um, to 45 and then people say whatever is over 50 is a novel. They're all, I think it's a bit of a grey area, but I'd say if you're not if you're not setting out to write a novella, then it's a novel. <laughs> I just keep going and allow it to be a short novel. There's nothing wrong with that either. We've got lots of questions about publishing um, and the industry's attitude towards novellas. Um, perhaps you could talk to us a little bit more about that and about what might be done to encourage the publishing industry to take a more positive attitude towards the form. Yeah, I, I think I read a comment in the uh, chat there about how expensive novellas feel to buy as a reader because you can read them in one sitting. But I, I think that is part of the problem that it can feel not like value for money. But I also feel, as I was sort of saying to Sarah, that they use such large print and put in so many extra pages and that makes it more expensive. Like why not allow it to be shorter and charge less? Like <laughs> nobody, nobody's making a fortune from this, from the writer's side <laughs> anyway. So, it, you know, and then it would allow you to do interesting things like have anthologies that might have two or three novellas from different writers or from the same writer. And so I, I I think there's room to play with that but thankfully there are still some competitions out there and some publishers um who aren't afraid of just taking that on and thinking you know this isn't necessarily going to make anyone a fortune but we want to just keep this form alive <laughs> we have time for one last question i think from the floor um, and actually, I'm going to end with a question also by Rebecca Latin Rostrone. Um, she wants you to speak a little bit more about uh, what Issy, your protagonist, um, writes of Finnegan's Wake. Uh, she says, Don't let Joyce think for a moment that this is his book I'm reading. It's a network of my own construction, taking me places only a reader can know. Um, and what Rebecca's hoping you'll reflect on a little bit more is you're thinking about what happens to books and perhaps particularly novellas once they're in the hands of the reader. Yeah, it's, um, I think when I wrote that for the character, I, I was trying to get a sense of um, bibliotherapy, if you like, of how we can read. And it's not necessarily about what we read, it's about what we're experiencing or what we're remembering. Um, and my experience of reading Finnegan's Wake was that I really didn't understand a lot of it. And so if I'm not reading for meaning, what am I reading for? And it became a whole new experience of a bit like beachcombing. I was picking up images or sentences and stories, and it, it was a whole new experience for me as a reader. And I found I enjoyed that so much that I did keep reading um but i don't expect anyone else would have the same understanding now of the text that i had and i think in some ways that like that's an amazing thing to have done for a writer to pack in so much information that then your reader doesn't even really need they just start to interpret things for themselves and fall in between the gaps and start having your own memories and recalls. I suppose it, it was a little bit like, like this old choose your own adventure novel, you know, books you used to have as a kid, or, you know, you could just go off at a tangent or find you lost somewhere else. Um, and I think that's what novellas in some sense do ask of the reader, that they invest something of themselves to, to interpret and to understand things that aren't necessarily on the page, but they should be reading between the lines, if that's, I don't, 
a more active experience, I think. That feels like a very appropriate moment to end on, given that um, all of us in the audience, whether or not we're writers, are also primarily readers. So it's nice to end on a moment where we empower and celebrate the reader. <laughs> I'm going to hand over to Sarah at this point. Hey, thank you ever so much, Emma, for coming and fielding the questions. Um, Emily, thank you so much um, for coming along this evening, talking to us about your wonderful new book um, and sharing your wisdom on novella writing with us. And audience, thank, thank you. you for cracking lots of questions. Really interesting and mm. thought provoking. So um, give yourselves, a, give yourselves a, a big hand. Thank you very much, Emily. And thank you also to the festival for hosting us. Yeah, thank you.